Hi, I'm John Kriegmer. We have been working with people since 1991, helping them accomplish huge financial goals in their life. In that period of time, we've noticed that really, there are two different types of clients. They look a lot alike. Similar incomes, very similar asset levels, and quite honestly, their goals, they look pretty similar. But we started to notice whenever we sat down and started putting together a financial plan and getting them action steps, that over the years, their outcomes, well, they were a little bit different. What we noticed is that one group of clients tended to stay on their plan, stay with the action steps, and really did tend to move towards their goals a little bit more successfully, while the other group was distracted, whether it be by stock market moving up and down or maybe even just toys they wanted to buy, they really didn't seem to accomplish their goals in the same way as the first group. We started looking at the common factors in clients that were able to accomplish their goals. We were able to bring it down to five relevant principles that play into the definition of true wealth. First, know what's most important to you and why. By identifying core values in your life, those things that are most important to you and the people that you hold dear, that gives you a great foundation to build upon whenever you're making financial decisions. Second, stick to your core values in decision making. It seems like the media is constantly chattering. It plays upon our emotions, it plays upon our decision making. It really takes us off base of where we need to be. One of the key things is stick to our core values whenever we're making financial decisions. Third, be open to wise counselors. In our financial lives, we need to center ourselves around people, wise counselors, that are gonna to listen to us, help us build a plan which is firmly focused upon your goals and your core values, and sometimes even encourage you to do things maybe that you don't wanna hear, but that will help you accomplish your goals. Fourth, wisely set your financial resources. When you have identified your core values, those things that are most dear to you, and then you're listening to wise counselors, you're more able to put together a plan and execute that and set your financial resources not only to accomplish the goals, but to impact those closest to you and the organizations that are most meaningful to you. And fifth, live with a spirit of gratitude. You know, there's so many things in life that we cannot control. And some of those things are great and turn out well and others are a real challenge no matter where it is in life that we are at, whenever we can live with a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness, the plan ends up coming together. True wealth, all the things in life that money cannot buy. It's not just a phrase that sounds good, but a truth that we live by as we focus on the things that are more important to us than money. So what about you? Who are the people that you cherish? Who are those that you wanna live life with and enjoy doing things with? When it comes down to it, what is your definition of true wealth? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Creekmer. About 10 years ago, Stacy and I started looking at different ways to increase our personal knowledge to make some individual financial decisions for ourselves. I'm just like everybody else. We just all learn and grow together, right? And so I started trying to figure out different things, and I came across a group of economists and, and market strategists. I started following them, and I started reading and learning and listening to them. One of the individuals is tonight's speaker, now, Mr. Bob Carey. He's the chief market strategist at First Trust Portfolios. I don't know the exact number currently, but they still manage somewhere over $220 billion of assets under management, one of the largest money management firms in the world, and he is their chief market strategist. He's going to come here tonight. He has a lot of information to give to us in a short period of time. And I've listened to Bob speak many times, and every time I walk away, I want to stay with more questions than answers. And what does that mean? I've been challenged mentally. And so I want to encourage you tonight, have your thinking cap on. I want to encourage you to take notes and write down questions and let's make sure we walk out of here tonight with answers that we need in order to make big decisions that will impact your life. Without further ado, Mr. Bob Carey. Good evening. Good evening. 
It is an honor to, uh, to be a part of tonight's uh, event. Uh, I, I told John I've got about a three-hour presentation. Uh, no, not really. I will, I will condense this uh, greatly. Uh, a lot of things going on. I, I, I live in the Chicago area. We're headquartered in Wheaton, Illinois. If anybody knows where Wheaton is, we're about 35 miles uh, west of Chicago. Uh, I've been there since 1991. And we now have 1,000 employees. I'm the 11th employee at the firm. And I've, I've, quite frankly, have not been able to get a job anywhere else in the last 32 years, nor have I wanted to. I'm very, very, uh, very blessed with uh, opportunities that I could not have imagined when I started my career uh, in 1986. I am a graduate of the University of Illinois. Uh, my wife is from Rock Island. My, my wife and I met in, uh, in, in Champaign, and, uh, and her aunt lived in Peoria, so I spent a lot of time here uh, when her aunt was uh, alive back in the 1980s. So anyhow, I want to share uh, just my thoughts on what's going on in the financial markets right now. Uh, we Obviously, we've had a lot of volatility last year. Uh, was it fun being an investor last year? No, it was a challenge, right? This year, it's a little bit better, uh, but at the same time, We've got banks failing. Uh, we've got a debt ceiling limit debate going on. We have a lot of things. I, I, was, I drove down here this afternoon, and I had CNBC on in the car. Uh, I like to kind of hear what's going on. And, and you know, through all of the opinion making that you get, you do actually learn a couple things along the way. Uh, but by the time I got here, I was, I was, I'm so confused. It's like, what's going on? I mean, we hear, for example, that um, you know, certain companies did really, really well in the first quarter. Their earnings beat expectations. In fact, a lot of companies, in fact, all the companies that have reported profits for the first quarter that are S&P 500 members, I think something like 80% of them actually came in above the estimates. There's a lot of analysts who follow companies out there, and they publish their, what they think these companies are going to be, are, will do as far as revenues and profitability. And so companies doing well, but again, at the same time, we've got banks, we had a couple banks fail. Uh, we've got some companies that realize that they probably have too many employees given where their sales are at right now. So we've got companies uh, you know, letting employees go, which is not good. Uh, so a lot of things going on, good and bad. Uh, at the end of the day, we have the best politicians that money can buy, <laughs> right? Uh, and we also have, by the way, the, other side, the flip side of that coin is we also have the best voters that money can buy too, right? So uh, this is, these are the issues that we're always grappling with as we think about the economy. But I think uh, taking a step back, I, think it's, it was, I loved hearing John's story about you know, a, a time that none of us can even imagine, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, we, we tend to forget what life was like back in the, in, the, in the BC period, and maybe even 500 years ago as recently as that, uh, the only way that you acquired wealth or power is you had to take it from somebody. You know, most people roaming the earth uh, literally lived hand to mouth. I mean, we were literally, there was no extra. And this whole idea of savings and financial services and wealth and all that, that's, that it wouldn't exist if it weren't for the fact that we have become incredibly productive as human beings in the last 2,000 years, and especially in the last 100 years. It's remarkable uh, how much the world has changed in the last 100 years. Um, I graduated from U of I in, in 1985, and there was a gentleman in the physics department. I would see this guy walking around. He was a retired uh, professor, but like a lot of academics, he really didn't truly retire. He was a professor emeritus, we called it, as, as they're called. And this guy would walk the hallways. Um, this guy, think about this for a second, this guy invented the transistor about 90 years ago. Do you think he changed the world? I mean, I, 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 even as, as much a visionary as I'm sure he was, um, it, it's just incredible how that guy changed the world. Um, he went to Stockholm accepted the Nobel Prize uh, in physics back in the late 1950s. He was finally recognized along with two other people that he worked with. And he did not bring his, his wife and two very, very young children. They were very, very young at the time. And the king of Sweden, you know, when you get the Nobel Prize, 
they, you get to meet the king of Sweden, which I think is pretty cool. I'm mostly Swedish, so that's pretty cool to me uh, that you get to meet the king of Sweden. My, I used to call my grandfather the king of Sweden uh, back in the day. But this, the, the king of Sweden says to him, uh, Dr. Bardeen, uh, where is your family? And uh, he said, you know what, I'll bring them next time. <laughs> and you know what's funny? Is he did. He went, about 15 years later, he won his second Nobel Prize. He came up with a theory of how basically matter behaves when things get really, really, really cold. We call it superconductivity. And these are things that we are just beginning, we're just now beginning to figure out how we can commercialize some of these things that he came up with, these ideas that he was you know, thinking up uh, 60, 70 years ago. It's incredible uh, how, much we, how much more we know about the physics of things, the way information is shared. You know, all of us, uh, obviously, we communicate all the time. Businesses are, are communicating the amount of information that is available to us as consumers, as businesses, as policymakers, is unprecedented uh, in these times. And companies, quite frankly, uh, some of them are very good at figuring out how to implement technology, and some of them are not so good. One of the best examples that I can give you, the first stock that I ever analyzed in my career was Kmart. It's okay to laugh. Uh, in their infinite wisdom, Kmart merged with Sears. Okay, that's like two dinosaurs mating before the meteor hit. Okay, um, they're long made, and I, as a kid, I remember as a kid going to both those stores all the time. There was pretty much where you went. Uh, but the reality is this: Kmart, as a business, really did not know what was on the shelves, what was in their inventory, what customers were buying, what customers weren't buying. They really. Uh, they were, it was, as we later learned, they really didn't have a handle on what was going on at the business. If you walked into a Kmart in 1985 and you looked at the inventory uh, and you've tried to figure out, well, how long is it going to take them to sell everything in the store? You think about retailing. What is retailing? It's all about getting stuff on the shelves and getting it sold, right? I mean, hopefully at a profit margin. Uh, it took about six months for Kmart to sell everything in the store and start all over again. So their, their turnover essentially was two times a year. Their inventory turnover was twice a year. Well, along comes this little company out of Benton, Bentonville, Arkansas. And everybody's like, Bentonville, Arkansas? Those people don't know anything about anything, right? They're a bunch of, bunch of hicks and hayseeds and whatnot. They don't know anything. Well, uh, they were selling the exact same items that Kmart was selling, but they had a lot more technology flowing through the business. They knew a lot more about what was selling, what was not selling. They were really the first major retailer to have a handle electronically on all of their, their, their inventory. Their sales cycle, their turnover, it wasn't six months we calculated back in 1985, it was two months. So you think about it, you're running a business and you're, turn, you're, turn, you're selling the same thing, probably generating the same profit margin. We, we could see that. But you, you turn over your inventory three times faster than your competitor? Who's still around? I mean, it's amazing how you know, companies come and they come, how they, they come and they go all the time. And this is the reality of our economy. So as we, we, we hear about companies failing, uh, we hear about banks failing, the reality is there, there are a lot of very, very well-run businesses uh, that are going to take the place of companies that have failed. And I think it's important to have that in the back of your mind. So anyhow, I've got a couple things I want to share with you as far as my outlook on the market. And I'm sharing this with you with the idea that this is just my opinion. This is, this is my staff. We, we sit down every single month and my slides you know, change from month to month. But this is really what we're thinking right now from a market perspective. You'll notice here on the screen that last year, uh, you'll see the line turn blue for the first time in a while. And basically what this represents, this chart goes all the way back to 1995, and what it represents is, you know, we look at the S&P 500 companies, and by the way, there's 503 companies in the S&P 500 for some reason. I, I'm not sure why. Uh, 
But we look at those, those 500 companies and then we calculate, well, how many of them, of those companies, performed better from a stock market perspective than the index or how many of them underperformed the market? And you notice that last year we finally saw some blue on that chart. And the market was down last year, but the average stock inside the S&P 500 actually outperformed the S&P 500 for the first time. You notice a lot of orange, right? Every single year, five years in a row. Orange, 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 orange. Um, the last time we had a five-year run where it was you know, basically the average stock underperforming was back in the late 1990s. What was going on back in the late 1990s? We were going through the dot-com revolution, right? The dot-com market. Everybody, the only stocks that people wanted to buy were technology stocks in the late 90s. Oh, wait a second. That's pretty much, that pretty much describes 2020, doesn't it? And 21. And so far this year, too, actually. You notice that the orange is back below. Uh, it's interesting. We all know technology is so important. It's the biggest part of the market. It's become a much, much bigger part of the economy. Every company employs, deploys technology. A lot of companies actually sell technology. But the fact is that the market has been very, very narrow over the last five or six, seven years. It's been a very, very challenging market to, um, to analyze. We have a portfolio analytics team at First Trust. We've got a small army of very, very socially challenged uh, financial analysts, okay? Uh, there are, there's a couple of them that actually I can speak with, and, and I, I am one of those analysts, I admit it. Um, but I feel like Dr. Doolittle, talk to the animals. I talk to the analysts, okay? <laughs> And I asked them, I said, well, you know, what, what are you seeing? Because this group, what they will do is, it, let's say, for example, John, you have a client, and uh, you have questions about why the portfolio might be performing, either good or bad. You want to figure out what's going on. Or maybe somebody comes to you with a portfolio from another financial advisor, and you're trying to get a handle on where those assets are invested. That's what this team will do, is they'll do a deep dive into that, into that portfolio. And as it turns out, almost, um, yeah, almost half the portfolios that this team uh, sees in the last year or so has a very, very high concentration of technology stocks in their portfolio. Apple, Microsoft, those kinds of companies. It's almost like the rest of the market doesn't exist. It's, it's very, the market's been very, very narrow here uh, over the last couple of years. And don't get me wrong, I think it's wonderful that we have a lot of good technology companies. In fact, that's one thing that separates us from other markets around the world. We have more technology companies, we have more, uh, technology, we have more technology in our economy than anywhere else. But from a stock market perspective, uh, what's happened is the average stock has fallen behind the rest of the market. So basically, we look at the market in, in a couple of different ways, but we look at how big companies are. What's the size of their Market capitalization, are they big companies, are they mid-sized companies, are they small companies? And you'll notice that over the last, let's say, uh, 12, 13 years, that the small and mid-cap companies, which, is, which are represented here, uh, that has just gone down and down and down and down. It's very, uh, I, I don't think it's good that this is, this is happening, but at the same time, I think there is an opportunity. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we've, we've been through this before. We went through the same thing in the late 1990s. You see it going down, and then all of a sudden you see it bouncing back. And I think on the other side of this market that we're in right now, we do think that we're in a bear market right now. When we're, you know, we're certain the market's it's up this year, but with the Fed raising interest rates, with the economy slowing down, all those different things, there's it, it's no doubt it's been a challenging market, and we think it's going to remain challenging. But on the other side of this 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 challenging environment that might persist for another year or two, uh, we think we're going to see much, much better performance from the rest of the market. So the companies that, that we categorize here that are small and mid-cap are about 9% of the total weight of, of all the stocks in the U.S., all the shares of all the companies that are traded in the United States, which means that um, you know 90% plus of the market is basically those big 500 companies, the S&P 500, uh, but from a profitability perspective, the, the fact is about 12% of the profits earned by all the companies that are publicly traded in the, in the U.S. are represented by these companies. So uh, from my perspective is if you, have, if you have time and you have the ability to, to, to 
what basically withstand volatility. On the other side of this, I think we're going to see a much broader market that is much wider. It's not just tech companies that are going up. I think investors will um, at some point discover what's going on here one way or another. But there's a lot of good opportunities uh, in the marketplace as we go forward. We also think that, quite frankly, bonds are expensive right now. Uh, what, is it, what is inflation average over the last you know, year or so? Five, six percent? I think the last reading we got was around five percent. Uh, the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury, which is the benchmark that we usually use when we talk about the bond market, is captured in the orange, okay? Uh, the orange right now, that yield is around three and a half percent. So you think about it, you've got inflation at five, and you lend, essentially lend your money to the U.S. Treasury, you get three and a half. Is that a, is that a, a prescription for success long term? for creating wealth. It really isn't, unfortunately. Now, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates. Rates are certainly higher than they were maybe a year and a half ago, two years, certainly higher than they were uh, in 2020. You can see how low the yield was. The yield over here in 2020 all, got all the way down to a half a percent. I mean, think about that. You talk, that's, that's called losing money safely is what that's called. <laughs> that's what that is. These banks, by the way, that just failed, that's what they had too much of. If you're earning a half a percent on your loan that you've issued in the form of a treasury note, a half a percent, and now prevailing interest rates are three, four, five, six percent, uh, what's the value of that instrument? It's down here. If your cost of capital is up here, but your return on capital is down here. You're not going to stick around. You're not going to, you're not going to survive. That's, that's just the way things are. That's just a fact. Um, those rates, they're higher than they were a couple of years ago. Inflation is coming down. The rate is decelerating. It's not that we haven't, we certainly can't, the, the Fed's going to probably raise interest rates tomorrow. And I don't think the chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, really wants to raise interest rates, but I think he feels like he has to to keep this trend of lower inflation in place for the time being. We we'll have to see, I mean, that's, that was the big debate this afternoon, is does the Fed raise interest rates one more time tomorrow and then indicate that, hey, we're done for a while, we're gonna take a pause. And big debate, some people think the Fed's gonna just continue to raise rates, some people think they're gonna stay the same, some people think they're gonna cut rates by the end of the year. I'm firmly planted in all three camps, I have no idea. Uh, none of us knows. Even they don't know, and that's their job to know. And even though they don't, they don't know, they don't know sometimes. But uh, that's another story. The blue line that you see in this graph is something that I call earnings yield. Okay, this is this is not an actual yield. This is more of a theoretical yield, but it's based upon market prices. It's based upon profitability. If all the companies in the S&P 500 were to pay out all of their earnings in the form of a dividend what would that dividend yield be? The average company in the S&P 500 only pays out about a third of its profits actually get paid out in dividends. The other uh, profits get you know, rolled back into the business. Maybe they use that money uh, to buy back their stock. There's all kinds of different things that companies do. But I'm trying to get a sense here of where the market is essentially pricing profitability compared to interest rates, okay? And you can see that the blue line has consistently been above the orange line for the last 15 to 16 years, which means that stocks offer you simply more upside. You, you get more. I don't, if, I, if you have a choice to make, do, I want, do, we, do you want to buy something that's lower yielding or do you want to buy something that's higher yielding? Well, the answer for the last 15 years or so has been the stock market. Now, that difference right now is about, right now that, that blue is around 6%. Uh, that, y that yield on the 10-year treasury is 3.5%. It's been about 3%, the difference between these two measures uh, for the last six or seven years. And you'll notice those two lines are very, very closely tied together, but there's been about that three percentage point difference. You go all the way to the far left-hand side of the graph. This starts in 1990, but I could have taken this back to 1980, 1970, 1960. These two lines used to sit right on top of each other, right on top of each other. So if you told me what the yield was at any point in time, going way back, um, 
for the 10-year Treasury, I could probably calculate what the earnings yield was for the S&P 500. That relationship completely fell apart in the, uh, in the wake of the dot-com meltdown, 9-11, uh, the financial crisis in 2008. All of that has it kind of sent things kind of on a tailspin, but we're starting to see these two lines once again fluctuate with each other, move together, correlate, maybe another way to put it, uh, but there's still, this diff there's still this difference of about two and a half percentage points. So I think from a, from a longer term perspective, you have to be, continue to be a shareholder. You have to own something. You can only do two things with your money, really. At the end of the day, you can lend it out and earn interest, or you can own something, okay? Or you could, you could technically, you could take your cash and bury it in the backyard or put it under your bed. That's, you know, that's another option. But the fact is, that's, it really comes down to, do you want to be an owner or do you want to be a lender? Okay? There's nothing wrong with being a lender for your assets that you want to keep relatively short term and keep safe. That's, not, that's never going to change. We all have to have money in the bank, money in treasuries, whatever it may be, things that you can you know, get your hands on quickly in case of an emergency. From a longer term perspective, I'm going to share this with you. Uh, you want to be a shareholder. Ultimately, this is, this is the profitability of the S&P 500 companies going back to 2009. Uh, we've plugged in earnings estimates for 2023 and 2024. Earnings are expected to be down a little bit this year compared to last year, but last year was a record level for profitability. Over the long term, the direction of the S&P 500 correlates very, very highly with these levels of profitability. You think about it, it should, right? If, if Companies become more profitable, they should become more valuable. The two kind of go hand in hand. It's not a perfect relationship, short term, but over a long term perspective, uh, it always works that way. Well, what about the rest of the world? Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about international investing and always, you know, always have had these questions, but uh, I just want to do a quick comparison, just from a long term perspective. Just imagine, uh, do, you want to, do you want to be a shareholder, an owner of these companies? Or do you want to be a, an owner of these companies? This is not a trick question, by the way. You want to be an owner of these companies, right? Look at the trend. Look at the difference in the trend. No comparison. U.S. companies. These are U.S. companies. These are non-U.S. companies. Big difference, right? The companies outside the U.S., this is all of Europe. This is Japan, China, South America, Latin America, however you want to, want to put it. It's, these are all the, profit, the profitability levels for all the companies based outside the U.S. I calculate that the rate of return on what companies have invested in their business outside the U.S. in this graph is about 5%. 5%. That, you know, so if you have a business that has $100 in assets, you get a $5 rate of return when it's all said and done. We run the same calculation for the S&P 500, and it's about 9%. These two measures, by the way, going back 20 years ago, they were exactly the same. This does not get talked about very much, but the companies that make up the S&P have become much, much higher return businesses over time that dominate the market averages. You know, you think about a, a Kmart, a Sears, they were 4 to 5 percent return businesses that are no longer around. Today we have, we have Walmart, which is a 12 to 13 percent return business. Amazon, we estimate, generates about a 14% return on its retail operations and so forth. So uh, we, we really have seen uh, quite an evolution uh, in this measure. Um, the last thing I want to share tonight, this is, um, I think, important from a longer-term perspective. I, I'm asked this question all the time about the direction of the market. As I said before, I think that this year, maybe parts of next year, I, I think it's, you know, it's time to kind of buckle up. I think we're going to have a lot of volatility. Uh, there are going to be times when the market's down. We were down today. Um, you know, nobody really knows why the market went down today. I, that's, that was what I heard on the TV as I'm listening, as I'm driving down here. The media would call, it calls me from time to time, and that's one of the questions that I'll get. On a day like today, the market is down. Well, hey, Bob, why is the market down? The technically correct answer to that question is we had, we had more sellers than buyers. Right? If the market is up, it's just the opposite. We got more buyers and sellers, right? Uh, the problem is if I give that answer to that reporter, they will never call me again. 
okay? And sometimes that's exactly what I do if there if are reporters that I find annoying, is I will tell them, I'll just say, hey, you know, why the market's down? It's because we had more, it's, you, anyhow. That being said, just kind of put that aside. Once again, it's about perspective. It's about thinking about the long term, okay? Um, this is my, essentially, the amount of money in circulation in my lifetime, okay? What I, what I did here is I, I looked up the figures going back to 1963 uh, for just how much money was in circulation every single year going back to 1963. And you can see that the line pretty much goes up every single year. It went up tremendously during COVID. The money supply today, basically, uh, for every dollar that was in circulation four or five years ago, today there's about a dollar forty. The money supply went up very, very rapidly in a very, very short period of time. It should not be a surprise that we have the inflation that we have. That, that just kind of comes with the territory. But basically, for every dollar that was in circulation, let's go back 50 years, back to 1973, for every dollar that was in circulation in 1973, there is now about $27. And you wonder why things cost what they do sometimes, right? I mean, you think about how much a new car costs, real estate, I don't care. Uh, what, and some things are cheaper. Some things didn't even exist 50 years ago. And that, you know, so you know, the, the cost of living is very debatable about you know, really what is inflation. That, that's another discussion. But ultimately, I, I think it's pretty fair to say that I, I, if, if you expect to be around for a long time, we, none of us knows, and you're planning on it, you need, to take it, you need to think about this chart and think about it seriously because what this tells me is that you need to think long term. Yes, this year could be challenging for the markets, but for those who've held on, that orange line that you see, that is the S&P 500 going back to 1963. The two don't necessarily go up in lockstep, but the trend is pretty clear over time. Over time, we have more products, we have more services that make up our economy. The companies that provide those products and services are constantly improving and evolving and coming up with new things. And you couple that with this, this pretty much ever-increasing quantity of, of money, and you're going to end up with, uh, with companies that are going to become a lot more valuable over the long term, okay? Uh, I turned 60 in about nine weeks. Nine weeks and three days, <laughs> okay? Uh, a lot of my friends, not surprisingly, are, turn, are turning 60 right now. Uh, I have gone to several birthday parties in the last couple months, friends turning 60, okay? Uh, when somebody hits a birthday like that, 60, 70, whatever the case may be, 50, uh, and you go to buy a a birthday card, what do you notice? You see a lot of cards for people turning 50, turning 40, turning whatever. Um, I realized, I, I noticed this last year, late last year, that at the bottom of the shelf, there are birthday cards for people turning 100. I'm pretty sure that when I was a kid, that wasn't something that, that existed, right? I mean, that was not a market. Uh, at the, I, was, I was at my Walgreens where I live, and at the bottom, there were, there were like five cards down there, I think four cards. I'm like, imagine thinking, boy, I gotta get a birthday card for Aunt Betty. Uh, which one do you think she'll like? I mean, who knows? I mean, that's a market. People turning 90, people turning 100, okay? My grandmother's sister died last year at 105. I mean, that's, my grandmother died in the 1970s. So, I mean, you start thinking about these things. So, I think it's important, the perspective that you have to have about Financial markets, I mean, believe me, there are times when the market goes down and you think to yourself, I am so, I'm a fool for having gotten involved in this. I started my career in 1986. I watched the market go up um, almost 100%, and then it crashed in 87. And I thought, boy, did I make a bad career move, right? And how, I mean, the, the Dow was around 1,500 when I started my career. The Dow's 30,000. And then we think about all the things that have happened just in the last 37 years. We've had crashes, we've had wars, we've had recessions, we've had pandemics, all kinds of things, housing crisis, banks failing, and yet here we are. So it's important, I think, ultimately to think about the long term and separating your portfolio. You've got things that you, you want to keep safe. Understanding returns might not be very high, but you've got to keep in mind that you have to have things 
that, that, that will have upside potential over time. And I think it's important, more important than ever, to have that perspective uh, in this environment. So with that, thank you for coming. I've got two more hours. I will not subject you to that. Um, but I certainly appreciate the chance to spend. I by the way, I love the fact that I can drive home and sleep in my own bed. I speak all over the country. Uh, I'm pretty much traveling somewhere every week. The fact that this is my only trip this week to Peoria. This is awesome. I love it. So it is, it is great to be here. So thank you. Once again, John Creekmer. Bob, thank you very John, much. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you, you very much. Buddy. It's so important to make sure we have knowledge, listen to different perspectives, listen to different viewpoints. It's really about trying to find out, number one, what are your primary goals you're trying to achieve? What are those big things you're trying to achieve? And then it's about acquiring knowledge so that whenever you set a plan and your action steps in place, with confidence you can move forward and have a higher probability of living that life you've always dreamed. Whenever you're going through things and you have questions, whether it's questions from tonight, it's questions you're walking through when you're looking at your account statements, it's questions that you, when you're thinking about, man, I really would love to do this. I'd like to move to this location. I would like to buy this additional farm. I'd like to be able to invest in somewhere. I have a question about how this political event, how does that affect things? Whenever you're doing those things, you can sit down by yourself and think through those, which is always, I think, very helpful to do to really refine your thoughts. You can choose to look at Facebook, you could choose, and I would not encourage that, you could choose to turn on the media, or you can pick up the phone and talk to a resource that you always have, and that's Creekmore Wealth Advisors. I would encourage you to walk through that, and you should know by now that if we don't know, we have friends and resources we can get answers for you, so you can be in a better spot to make wise decisions. I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks for the faith and trust you placed in us. Uh, we'll be around here all night until everyone leaves, so uh, feel free to hang out. Otherwise, talk to you guys later.